Claire Highbloom interviews Jesus on the subject of Christian religion. The interview took place in Wilkesdale, Queensland, Australia, on the 18th of March, 2013. This is session two, part two. We're back from our little break. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's have a look at question number five. How can a conventional Christian who follows everything they've been taught in church in their life and believes that they will arrive in the spirit world into a place of love and light and to the arms of Jesus, cope with the shock of discovering their true soul condition and their actual growth in love and the error of the teachings they received? Yeah, this is an interesting question, Claire, because it sort of presupposes that a person, once they enter the spirit world, even reflects upon the difference between what they've promised and, and what they've ended up having. The reality is for the majority of people when they end up in the spirit world, they finish up with a experience that they end up having, but then they start justifying to themselves why they have that experience. So, so if we look at the average Christian's mm. passing, now, here I'm talking about a Christian who hasn't really had the heart religion touch them. Mm. Right? In yep. other words, they've, they've practiced the sort of rules and tenets mm. of their church. Um, they've rigidly followed what they believe is their interpretation of the Bible. But the love part of the religion's faith hasn't really touched their heart. So mm. that's the kind of person yes. I'm talking about now. When they pass into the spirit world, they often, they often realise they are not in the arms of Jesus, as mm. they were promised. They don't meet Jesus generally. And um, often they are in a place of semi-darkness or darkness in the spirit world. It depends how moral they've been as mm. to where they will be. They'll, if they've been quite moral on the earth, and they'll probably end up in the middle of the first sphere or near the top end of the first sphere of the spirit world. <clears throat> If they have been a little immoral or they've been judgmental or other kinds of emotions, which sometimes they feel induced to be because of their knowledge of what they believe is the truth, then they'll be mm -hmm. usually a bit lower in the spirit world as a result. Now, if we, if we look at where they arrive, so they arrive now in the spirit world, they realise they're not in the arms of Jesus, they're not in a, some kind of paradise condition that they expected, and some of them even do literally expect to be playing harps as mm -hmm. angels with Jesus mm -hmm. or whatever. And, uh, of course, I'd be pretty bored with that kind of behaviour every day, but you know, they, they, they haven't considered that. But they pass into this location where it was nothing like they expected. Usually the very first thing that such a person does is begin to justify to themselves why they're not in the location they expect. They don't say to themselves, I'm in this location because uh, there was obviously a lack of love mm. or there's a lack of heart in my practices. They don't say that. They go, oh, there's something wrong with my practices or there's something wrong with what I've taught or, or they'll go through other series of justifications like maybe I'm just in a temporary location. Maybe I need to do some extra things and I'll get into the location mm. that I've been promised. So they have all sorts of specific belief systems that would cause them to remain stagnant and to not accept that there is a major shock. In other words, the physical surroundings show them that something is wrong. Yeah. But because they can't emotionally and intellectually cope with the fact that something's wrong because they're not humble enough, they won't even let themselves be shocked. Wow. That's real denial. That is real denial. Mm. Yep. And you'll be surprised how many oh. people from all sorts of religious denominations arrive in the spirit world in that level of denial, oh. huge levels of denial. Now, it now will take some time between getting between this condition mm -hmm. of almost total denial that everything they've been promised hasn't worked out into a condition where they realise that the reason why it hasn't worked out is because the love part of the religion faith, of the religion does not touch their heart. Mm -hmm. And it's what happens in that time period, which is often a very long time period. It's usually the longest time period of a person's progress often. There's only one other time period generally as long, and, and that is the time period of when a person becomes satisfied of where they are. Right. So these two problems is the denial period of their, of their life and the self-satisfied period of their life are the two primary causes of 
lack of progression, both on earth and in the spirit world. Mm. So usually a person in the spirit, who arrives in the spirit world arrives in one or both of those conditions. And as a result, it can take a long period of time before they even will admit to themselves that their own teachings that they imbibed on earth weren't satisfied and, were not, and did not come true. Mm. Now, that applies to the average person who passes from this earth to the spirit world. I do not classify a Christian who has a heart-based religion for love mm. as the average person. Mm -hmm. They are completely different to the average person, mm -hmm. as is the Muslim who has a heart-based yes. religion for love. Yes, He's completely different to the yes. average person as well. Because when you have love guiding your heart and soul, now you also have a semblance or, or, or at least a smidge generally of humility. Mm. And as a result, you can admit to yourself the shock of it's not how I expected. And then you begin to ask questions. Why isn't it how I expected? What happened to cause it to be not how I expected? And so forth. And as a result of these questions, you get to have the answers given mm. to you from mm. spirits who have already learnt the answers mm. to those questions. Mm. And so my suggestion to any person who passes into the spirit world where their expectations of the spirit world aren't the same as their actual location, and that is my feeling, they, all they need to assess, is what I expected it to be exactly what it is now. Yeah. And if it is not, have the humility to see that what you believed was obviously false mm. and there is some truth you need to imbibe and you need someone to tell you what that is. Yep. <laughs> someone yep. who knows to tell you what that is. And that's to me how is the best, is the best method of how to cope with the process of passing and any shock you may experience mm. in passing. Of course, to do that requires a, a certain amount of self-analysis. You need to be able to say to yourself, that's what I believed on earth and that didn't happen. That's what I believed on earth and that didn't happen either. And that's what I, what I thought on earth and it still didn't happen. <laughs> and, mm. and all of these things didn't happen. So something's wrong. Yeah. It requires some kind of self-analysis to be able to go, something's wrong. Now, the next step after that is the critical step. Realise something's wrong and then ask for assistance from somebody who's brighter than yourself mm. who might know the answers to those questions. Mm. The majority of people don't want to do that for all sorts of reasons. They don't want to admit that they, what they thought was wrong was actually wrong. They don't want to have the humility to change. They want to hold on to the false beliefs even though they are patently obvious that it is wrong based on the, you know, spirit, what, it is blatantly obvious in the spirit world often that something is wrong at, like, from their belief systems on earth. But they don't want to admit that to themselves. That's a lack of humility. Mm. And if we have a lack of humility, we're going to very much struggle in the spirit world mm. because we're not going to want external assistance. Mm. And if you don't want external assistance in the spirit world, you have no hope of progressing ever because the only type of assistance you will ever get is from a spirit or God, which are all external assistances. Yeah. So if we feel that we can resolve all the questions by ourselves within ourselves, we will be greatly mistaken mm. and uh, we will stay stagnant mm. for long periods of time mm. in the spirit world. Something incidental <laughs> that just came into my mind. Yep. Do you keep your guide when you pass? Yes, uh, yes. Your guide often remains with you after mm. you've passed, uh, depending on your condition, of course. Mm. If your condition is equal to your guide, then, of course, they're more like your friend than your guide. Yes. But if your condition is, is not as loving as your guide's condition, then your guide will continue to endeavour to, to guide you in the spirit okay. world. However, the majority of people who are Christian believe that if an angel of light comes to them and tells them something beyond the, what they have already learned in the Bible, mm. and in fact there is a scripture, of course, mm. in the Bible that says this, that they should reject them. Mm. So when their guide, their angel of light, comes to them, and says, I'm your guide, I've been with you all of your life, I know all of your life, they say, sorry, you must be of the devil. Yeah. The Bible talked to me about people like you, I'm going to not listen to you, get away from you, me, me, you worker of lawlessness, and they quote all these scriptures, 
And the poor spirit who's been looking after that person on earth all of their life um, has to walk away uh, and wait. And wait. Until the person who's, who's, who's passed mm. has the willingness to actually go, oh, maybe that person was my God. Maybe there is such a thing as God's <laughs> even. <laughs> and maybe oh. I should ask him because mm. he's brighter than I. And remember what Jesus said about brightness, let your brightness shine mm. so it'd be brighter than me. Maybe, maybe I should have listened to him and then asked him back. But sometimes I've seen that happen 200 years after. Mm. And during that time, that person on, who, who's passed uh, feels like they've got no one to guide them. Mm. But they're rejecting their own God. Yeah. yeah, and that's a frequent occurrence, yeah. and particularly amongst Christians, mm. because Christians are told because of that of these Bible mm. beliefs mm. that they imbibe while they're on earth, and then when they pass, they remember them, of course, and they actually remember them more easily, yeah, uh, because their mind is a lot clearer as yes. a result of the operations of the spirit body. They remember a lot of these quotations even more clearly than they did on earth, mm. and then as a result of that, they decide to embrace that belief system. Still trusting the Bible is God's word, but, but preventing them from further progression for, for a long periods of time. Mm. And it's usually only love that gets them out of that condition. When I say love, the love they have to want to connect to God, if it yes. exists, or the love, and, and more often it is, the love they have of wanting to connect to others, yes. other people. Um, and that love drives them to find out some things, some, find out some more truth. And then in finding out that more truth, they realise to them and so forth. They're still available to them and so forth. But, but what they believe to be true is not true. So it's usually some kind of growth or expansion in their soul of love that causes them to have the awakening of their soul, as it were. So, you know, for the majority of people who pass, and particularly for the majority of Christians who pass, if, if love hasn't, hasn't been the governing factor of their practice of religion on earth, then love won't be the governing factor of their practice of religion in the spirit world. Mm -hmm. They'll arrive in a very dark condition as a result. Mm -hmm. And then as a result of that dark condition, it will only be a series of events that occur over a long period of time generally that causes them to re realise that love hasn't been the guiding factor in their life and it causes them to open their heart to love. And once their heart is open to love, then they start engaging progression mm -hmm. in a more rapid way. The, the problem in the spirit world is gaining the awakening. And gaining the awakening is all about humility or a lack of it. Yeah. And, uh, and it's the lack of humility that causes the inability to have an awakening. So, so again, as I say about the daily practices mm -hmm. that we mentioned in question two, I think it was, um, those daily practices will help us. Mm -hmm. Not only now, but also after we pass. Yes, of course. Uh, to, gain, to gain this awakening mm. of our soul to the extent where we're willing to conceive things that we, that we have previously believed were true, but now which our life is demonstrating to us can't have been true. Mm. Yeah. So, so my suggestion to the average person of any religious faith is when you find after you've passed that what you believed in your religious faith hasn't worked out to be true, then immediately say to yourself, all right, there's, there's things I need to learn and be humble enough to ask for help to learn. And when a brighter spirit comes to you, instead of dismissing them as an angel of the devil, <laughs> listen to them and learn from them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, number six. How can we learn to feel the soul of God as a real experience and to trust the purity source. Well, I suppose there's two aspects to this question, isn't it? There's firstly feeling the soul of God, and the second part, which I feel is a very important part of this question, is trusting that God is the source of those experiences. And the second is very much more difficult, probably, to achieve than the first in some ways, um, because, because there are many spirits masquerading as gods mm. who wish to engage humans in their addictions in order to have certain emotions met on the spirit side. And so, you know, sometimes we long for God to come, like someone like Neil Donald Walsh, for example, mm. longed for God to come to him. And because of some, certain addictions that he has, a spirit who claimed himself to be God, and, and also not a very developed spirit who claimed himself to be God, came to him 
and claimed himself to be God and started sharing or channeling, if you like, spirit through this mediumship process, all of these truths mm. to Neil Donna Walsh that Neil Donna Walsh now believes as completely true. Does that make sense? Now, that God who channeled to Neil Donald Walsh wasn't God. No. Because the truths that that spirit channeled to Neil Donald Walsh were very limited when it comes to the actual truths of the universe. Mm. And also, he channeled a lot of false teachings, such as reincarnation, mm. to Neil Donald Walsh and, uh, and told Neil Donald Walsh he had 600 previous lives or so on yeah. and so forth, all of which is false. Mm. Mm. And, uh, and so these, this is an indication that it was just a spirit who set himself up as God, channeling all of this material to Neil Donald Walsh, and Neil Donald Walsh was willing to accept it was God. Mm. Yes. Without consideration of anything else. And when I say it without consideration of anything else, it's the consideration of three primary things that will determine whether the connection is with God or not. It is love, truth, and humility, mm. the same three things we keep mentioning. You see, if the teaching that is being channeled from a spirit to a person on earth does not contain love, then it can't be from God. If the teaching channeled from the spirit world is not demonstratedly able to be demonstrated through truth, then it can't be from God. And if the teaching results in the person on earth becoming arrogant mm. and self-satisfied and self-important, mm. then the teaching can't be coming from God. Mm. So, so the reality is that many of these so-called channelings from God that exist on, the, on earth today never came from God. They came from spirits setting themselves up either as an intermediary between God and man or as God themselves, they believe themselves to be God, and they channel all of this information of what they believe truth to be. So that then raises the question, as you said, how do I know that I'm actually connecting with God? Mm. Well, the connection with God is, as we know, established through the connection with the Holy Spirit. And I know you have a question about the Holy Spirit coming, so I won't elucidate too much about the question. But the Holy Spirit is a, is a spirit of truth. It requires you to be in a complete condition of personal truth and honesty with yourself before you will be able to connect with anything to do with God. In addition, it's dependent upon humility and longing. Mm. Now, God feels our true longings, mm. not our facade. Mm. So we can have a facade of longing for God and all we're going to attract in a facade is spirits who, in, who interpret, or, or what's the word I'm looking for, imitate, who imitate God, or attempt to at least imitate God. It is not going to be God herself, because while we're in our facade, we can only attract a facade. Yeah. In other words, yeah. while I'm trying to practice a facade myself, I'm only going to attract a God which is really a spirit mm. who is in the facade of God, who is, who is trying to themselves be God mm. and claiming themselves to be God. Mm. Mm. That's a very dangerous thing to do, of course, because then we're not connecting with God at all. If we are in our facade, the, fast, the best thing we can do first is get out of our facade to become real about ourselves. That's humility. We need to become humble about what's really in us. When we become humble about what's really in us, we now have the ability to petition God in our humility to receive truths. And we also have the ability to receive divine love from God if we're out of our facade. Mm. The majority of people who connect to God are not out of their facade. Or I should say more clearly, the majority of people who attempt the connection with God are in addictions with what they wish God to supply to them during the connection. Wow. As a result of that, it's highly unlikely they will ever connect to God. Because God requires us to be in a state of truth in order to connect to God. Truth and humility and longing for God's love. So the question you ask is a very important question if you look at it this way, because you see there are so many external influences that can imitate themselves as being God, that the average person may even accept. I know many Christians who say to me, 
I hear God's voice every day. And God said to me, you know that scripture in Isaiah 24? You know, and they, re they ream off what God said to them. And I'm going, I'm sorry, my friend, but it's a spirit who's claiming to be God that you want to believe is God that's saying these things to you. That's all it is. Because if it was God, you wouldn't even hear the voice. It has to be a soul-to-soul -soul connection for it to be God. And God does not have the voice that appears in your mind or in your ear. That's not how God works, yeah. ever. Mm -hmm. And they, of course, don't agree with that and wait until the spirit will, generally. Find out you were right. <laughs> find out that that was correct. And yes. They actually finish up at some point often meeting the spirit who was, in, who was dropping all these words into them. If the spirit who was doing it was humble enough to even admit that he was doing it. But the real God, the God that is our parent and creator, communicates with us soul to soul, but through this connection of the Holy Spirit. And the connection with the Holy Spirit is maintained through three states within ourselves. The first one being a state of humility, mm -hmm. which is a state of being open and willing to see every error and fault within ourselves. And also, by the way, every good thing and positive thing within ourselves. The state of truth, the passionate desire for divine truth to enter our heart, and the state of longing for the true God, the real God's love to enter our heart. Now, in the first century I said, God does not give us a snake right? when we ask for something else. God gives us instead exactly what we ask for. Mm. Yes. Now, if what we're asking for is a facade, okay. we will get one. Mm. If we're asking for a God who feeds our addictions, we will get a spirit who we think is God feeding our addictions. Wow. If we truly ask for a God who loves us and who, who wants to share truth with us and is willing to connect to us in our humility, that's when we'll get the real God. Right. Right? Yeah. So you can see that it requires... Um, sorry, do I just need to stop for a sec? Yeah, we were up to... <laughs> I can't remember. <laughs> yeah, you just remember you were talking about when God said... Um, oh, about what If you're wanting for. a snake, he doesn't send... Oh, no, if you're wanting a, a fish, he doesn't send you, you a snake. snake. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. Yes. yeah. So, you know, it's what you ask for is what you mm. get. So, but it's what you ask for from your soul, mm. not from your mind. Mm. So your mind might go, yeah, I'd like a bit of God's love, right? <laughs> <laughs> but your soul's going, yeah, really what I want is I don't want to have to face any personal emotions. I don't want to have to face any personal untruth that I have. I don't want to have to change my life. I don't want to have to, you know, change my relationships or whatever else. I don't want to have to become more loving. Give me whatever it is you can give me with that. <laughs> mm, mm. And of course, that's the prayer coming out of your soul. And so that's what you get. And what you'll get under those circumstances is often a heap of spirits, many of them dark, mm. connecting with you, imitating God or attempting to imitate God with you so that you think or believe that they are God. And you finish up hearing and, you know, getting all of their, all of your addictions, everything you want met through those particular things. Of course, it doesn't last for a long period of time because it can't. Hmm. When we truly go to God with a complete and pure heart, we will always get God. Hmm. That's one of the laws of the universe, in hmm. fact. But it requires that our heart is sincere and pure. And that is the problem. The problem for most people is they believe their heart is sincere and pure when at the same time it's quite clear to God that they're not sincere or purely motivated. And under those circumstances, the Holy Spirit cannot connect. Mm. And instead, other spirits who were people who used to live on earth connect instead. Mm. And those spirits may tell them all sorts of things. Some of those things may be good for their progression and some of those things may be bad. But they won't be connecting with God. Okay. To connect with God requires pure, unadulterated passion and desire mm. in the direction of truth and love. Mm. That's what it requires from mm. our soul. That's why the majority of people have initial influx of God's love and then never experience that again because they never reach the same condition of desire, for, passionately desiring truth and a passionate desire for God that's purely motivated. 
they rest on their laurels of the past experience. Mm. 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 So the only way that we can really tell whether we're really connecting with God is if, and if our motive is pure. And it's not what we think our motive is. It's what our motive actually is mm. that drives the connection. Mm. God always perfectly responds mm. to our motivation, whether our motivation is pure or not. And by that, what I mean is God responds by saying, no, I can't respond <laughs> to a motivation that's impure. Right. And instead, we will get other people responding mm. to that impure motivation. So would you pray for purity? Definitely. Mm. Pray for integrity. Pray for honesty with yourself. Mm. Pray for purity. All of these ultimate qualities that are a part of our soul can be prayed for and God will respond to these prayers. Okay. So you can be in a state of impurity, but you recognise that and you just don't know which way you're going. So. And that's the state of purity. Okay. Being in a state of impurity and knowing where you're impure is recognising a, hu a humble state. Right. In that humble state, you can go to God and know that you're yes. going to get God. Yes. Does that make okay. sense? Okay. So it's not that difficult. No, it's not difficult. You don't have to be perfect. Mm. You just have to be honest. Mm. <laughs> yes, yes. That's why the Holy Spirit's called the spirit of truth, because <laughs> you have to be truthful. You have to be honest, not mm. only with yourself, but also with God and everyone around you. Mm. That's the only time that you will get a connection with God. Now, the majority of people do not ma make that connection happen very frequently because it is rare that we're actually really completely honest with ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> and it's rare that we really have a strong desire to do anything. And if you look at our day-to-day -day life, as I encouraged in a recent interview, or a recent talk that I gave about what is your treasure, mm. and you actually analyse how many hours you spend longing for God compared to how many hours you spend longing to watch the television, often you will find that the longing to watch the television is much higher than your longing mm. <laughs> to connect with God. And, and God's really feeling what? Would God be feeling, yes, I, I feel like I'm really wanted in your life? No. Mm -hmm. God's feeling like, no, what you really want is your telly. So I'll give you a bigger one. <laughs> you know? yeah. You're not going to get God, though, in that interaction mm. because, because God can know, knows your true motivations, mm. even if you are not willing to admit to them. God knows them. Now, if my longing is to watch telly for 20 hours a week and my longing is to connect to God for two hours a week, how important is God to me? Well, not very important, I would suggest. Mm. And if God's not that important to me, which kind of God is going to respond to my request when I give it? Mm. Like, mm. can you see that if I've got a, a, a request that lacks integrity and lacks purity, lacks desire then aren't I only going to attract a spirit who answers, who's willing to accede to my lack of integrity, yeah. accede to my lack of impurity, and accede to my lack of desire? Mm. God certainly isn't going to respond. Mm. Right? Now, that spirit may claim to be God, but it's immaterial. Mm, of course. And I'm just fooling myself if mm. I believe that I can spend two hours longing for God a week and actually get God. Mm. I, I'm really just fooling myself. Mm. If I... If I if I can find that I can spend more time watching the television than I can connecting with God, then I'm just fooling myself as to God's importance to myself in my life. Mm. I'm just fooling myself. And if I'm fooling myself, surely I'm going to attract a spirit who's willing to fool me as well. That's right. Mm. Yeah. But God wouldn't be willing to do such, so God wouldn't connect under mm. those circumstances. So this is where it requires a lot of honesty with self and a lot of personal integrity, a lot of self-analysis to see... Is my desire really pure? Now, if it's not, you can make it. Yeah. You can turn it into a pure desire. You know, if you find yourself watching 20, 20 hours of television a week and you spend one hour praying a week and you find yourself with that, what I would classify as a, as a priority issue <laughs> inside, of, inside of yourself, then you can swap it over to be 20 hours of God a week and two hours of television a week quite easily mm -hmm. through your desire, through the exercise of your will. You could change if you so desired. But a lot of times uh, it's our addictions that are driving our actions in our day-to-day -day life and a lot of times we don't want to break our addictions and so we don't desire. Mm. And that really, again, it comes down to whether our desire for God is pure. Mm. Mm. When we have a pure desire for God that's driven by a longing and a humble heart that's desiring truth, God always answers, always. Mm. 
if God's not answering or a different God is answering, it's because of the impurity in one of those three things. Impurity with regard to our humility, our lack of desire for truth, or our lack of desire to have a relationship with God and actually receive God's love. Mm. 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 Excellent. Thank you. All right. Nice. Number seven. Does God delegate spiritual inspiration and grace to celestial angels and other souls more developed in love? Okay. Um, well, let's define grace compared to spiritual inspiration. All right. Grace to me is the part of God that God, is God's love. Mm. And God does not delegate grace okay. to any spirit in the spirit world. That doesn't mean that these spirits don't have a grace of their own. Mm. It just means that the grace that comes from God, which is all about the reception of God's love and, and forgiveness that comes with the grace of God's love, that can only be given by God and no other spirit. It, there is no intermediary that can be established for the reception of grace into the human soul. Okay. Grace comes directly from God and enters the human soul through the connection with the Holy Spirit. There is no other way in which a human can receive grace from God. And God doesn't pass grace to a third party in order to get it to you. Mm, mm. And in fact, the laws are governing the use of the Holy Spirit, which is a conduit, if you like, between God and us, govern it in such a way that it can only connect between God and uh, one person at, in terms of a soul. It can connect to millions of them at the same time but it won't go via that person to another. Mm. Does that make sense? It can only be a direct connection between yeah. God and your soul, yeah. God and my soul, not between God, your soul, and then to my soul. Mm. That does not occur ever. Mm. So the Holy Spirit is only capable of this connection between God on one end and one human soul, of, and, or billions of human souls, on the other end. Does that make sense? Mm. And it's a one-to-one -one connection in the sense that God feels everything you feel and if you're open to it, you will be able to feel as much as you're able to cope with of what God feels. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. There's the expression of God's grace. And God does not delegate that to any spirit or any other living person, mm. including Jesus. Mm. Mm. Right? And the Holy Spirit is not an entity, so it's not even delegated to the Holy Spirit. Yeah. The Holy Spirit is an energy conduit between God, and it's mm. one of God's energies that allows the transmission of grace, mm. or transmission of divine love from God to the human soul. The second part of the question, though, is about inspiration. And the reality is God always gives inspiration via spirits of higher development okay. than ourselves, and sometimes even from spirits of even lower development mm. than ourselves, and people on earth of lower development. It just depends on their gifts that they have at the time. So, for example... Let's say I have the gift of playing music and I'm often just inspired when I'm playing music. I might have darkness about me in other aspects of my life, but when I'm in my music, I can feel this connection with God. Mm. I can feel inspired, right? In that place, spirits will inspire me to write things mm. with my music. And they might be spirits who are in dark place or in a bright place, depending on my condition and what I attract at the time. But I will receive inspiration from anybody in the spirit world and that will inspire what I write for my music. Now, if my condition is such that I desire to be inspired by people who have a, a greater condition of love than myself, then there's a high likelihood I will attract such spirits mm. in my day-to-day -day life. But again, it has to be a sincere attraction. Mm. It can't be something that I just think in my mind. Mm. It has to be what I desire in my soul. It has to be a pure, unadulterated desire for inspiration. Now, God often delegates this inspiration. And in fact, God inspires us in many different directions, not directly, but by asking spirits who are close, more closely connected with God to give us the inspiration that God cannot share with us because we refuse to connect to God. And while we allow a connection with the spirit, but don't allow the connection with God, God is asking the Spirit to try to help us yeah. to connect to God. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yes, yes. So God is using all of the tools at God's disposal. And there are many hundreds and hundreds of tools. Uh, in, my case, in, in my opinion, there's many millions of tools that God has, has mm. at his disposal 
in order to give us inspiration to move us in a direction that's positive for our soul. Now, some of these tools are the laws of the universe that God's already created. The law of attraction is a tool, for example, the law of cause and effect. The law of attraction is a great tool because it, it causes our soul to attract to us events that tell us whether we were in or out of harmony mm. with love when we acted. The, the law of cause and effect is a great law too because it tells us that if we do something that results in harm to ourselves, then obviously something in the doing must have been unloving. And that, that tells us, that gives us a message. But then God also inspires creatures around us, not, not only um, other other humans or, and other spirits who are basically human anyway, but also creatures around mm. us to inspire us. So, so for example, if my house is full of vermin, um, God is telling me something through that process. Yeah, yeah. Something to do with my soul yeah. that I can think upon and, and reflect upon. Yeah. If I notice a bird attacking the window, God is telling me something through this process. It's just a bird operating with the effect of my own soul attacking the window, but it's telling me something about my own soul and its condition. Mm. And if I'm willing to be open to experiencing what it's all about, I'll find out the answer to why that's occurring. But greater inspiration than that is directly from spirits who are our friends, mm. you know, who love us and care for us and who are our friends. That kind of inspiration can be very much more direct and also very much more clear in its inspiration. And so God often guides spirits who are in higher development than ourselves to, to try to connect with us by dropping thoughts into our mind mm. and also by if, they are, if our mind is open to such things and also by helping us with different events in our lives to see different things, see different books, see, yes. have different experiences yes. so that we become aware of something that we weren't previously aware of. Mm. So God is always inspiring us in that direction. And when we personally shut down our relationship with God, God then reverts to everything else at God's disposal to try to help open that relationship again. Wow. And that's what God's doing with all humanity right at the yeah. present. Mm. Yeah. So it's a beautiful thing that firstly, God's grace only comes directly from God to us because mm. then we're assured that this is a direct connection with God. But it's also a beautiful thing that God asks all of the people who are connecting with God to, ins to, to help inspire us mm, mm. To, to embrace this relationship mm. with God. So, you know, God's got so many tools at his disposal that um, the most person, people on earth have no awareness whatsoever of the, a number of tools at the disposal. And, in fact, most people on earth sort of view them as just normal events happening or something yeah. like that. You know, they don't sort of see them as... Mm. God directed inspirations. Mm, mm. But the reality is, if you could see what was operating in the spirit world, you would see all of these God directed inspirations occurring at every single moment for every single individual. Wow. Whoever lives on the planet and also who lives in the spirit world. Wow. Yeah. And the same thing happened happen to um, some of the darker spirits. Are they helped? Yep. Uh, similarly? Exactly the same way. Mm. Exactly the same way. They can't connect to God because of their condition mm. and their refusal to desire such a relationship. But oh, there's all these external events all happening all at the same time, all these laws, all these spirits coming back and forth, trying to influence them mm. into a state of becoming aware. Mm. So God never gives up on anyone. No, no. God's like, you know, there's no such thing as a person who's completely, you know, discommunicated from God mm. or excommunicated mm. from God. No, no such thing can ever exist, in no. fact. And... Uh, and God never excommunicates anybody from having a relationship with God under any circumstances, but God always governs the relationship through the law. Mm. So laws govern all relationships. Mm. But, and, and for us to have a relationship with God, we obviously need to embrace the laws that such relationships involve. But, uh, but even if we choose to not do that, God is still trying to communicate with us through all of the other parts of the universe giving us inspiration in all sorts of directions yeah. to try and lead us back to God. Yeah. Yep. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, it is wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> thank goodness. <laughs> yeah, thank goodness. Like, without it, the majority of us, including myself, would never have got to God, right? <laughs> yeah. um, and does and, uh, this question, sorry, question eight. Yep. Does God connect directly to us through the Holy Spirit? Yes. In fact, it is the only way that I know of at this point in time that God connects directly to us mm. is through the Holy Spirit. 
that's why I called it the Holy Spirit, mm. because it was the, the, the term holy, meaning pure, perfect, without sin. And uh, the, the reason why I called it the Holy Spirit, or, or the feeling that I had at the time when I called it that name, was that it was, it was the most important energy coming from God. Mm. I saw it as more important than the creative energy coming from God, more important than the maintenance type of wow. energy that comes from God is this energy that carries divine love to the human soul. Mm. And it only carries divine love to the human soul. The Holy Spirit has no other operation. Mm. It doesn't create. The Holy Spirit has no purpose in creation, as the Bible claims. Mm. The Holy Spirit doesn't create. God creates mm. through a creative energy and force, mm. right, which, is, which is separate to the Holy Spirit itself. But the Holy Spirit, it does have a creative actions, but, but the Holy Spirit itself is, a, is an energy, a conduit for the flow of love. Mm. And, and not just the flow of any love, it's the flow of God's love yeah. into us, transforming us into God's substance. In other words, the substance of, God love, that, of God's love enters our soul and transforms our soul. If you could actually look at the soul... Mm you would see the transformation taking place in the soul. Mm. And, and in fact, spirits in the soul union condition see that transformation taking place as the soul receives divine love from wow. God. And so what happens is the soul itself is transformed from the only human soul, the image of God, into the substance of divine, a divine soul. It now not just the image of God, but rather the image that now contains a part of God's substance. Yes, yes. Which is a completely different creature, yes. actually. And in fact, uh, the majority of people in the spirit world, uh, only above the sixth dimension of the spirit world, begin to see that different mm. creature. Mm. And they start seeing... And in fact, the spirits of the sixth dimension often think of these spirits in a higher location as being different creatures. Mm. And they don't consider that mm. they could be mm. a different creature. And that's the transformation that we often sort of hear about and that's desire, right. is this yeah. transformation. You do become a completely new creature. You do become a completely new creature that's divine in its nature. You mm. are not God no. and you will never be such. Mm. Mm. But, but a part of God's substance, love, mm. is now within you to a degree that you've become at one with God in the way you love. Mm. And because of this at one with God in the way that you love, it doesn't mean you might make other mistakes because mm. you will. Mm. You, may, you may not have other knowledge because you will continually gather more knowledge. You're not perfected in knowledge when you're at one with God. Right. You're perfected in love. Yeah. Right? It's love that is the underlying guidepost of what happens when you become at one with God. Yeah. So when you become at one with God, now that you're at one with God, your soul has actually got completely different characteristics and nature that it had before. It has abilities that it never had before mm. and that can never have just as a completed human soul. Wow. And, and it's the, the entry of the divine, the entry yeah. of God's love that's entering you that causes these transitions in the soul that change the very formation of the soul itself into and, and add to its capacities and abilities to such an extent that the soul's capacities and abilities become godlike. Mm. And, uh, and this is the transformation that occurs that I call the new birth yeah. and that I refer to as being born again. Now, now, that's the work of the Holy Spirit. That's why the Holy Spirit is a holy spirit mm. Mm. because the, the work mm. of this Holy Spirit is to cause this transformation of the human soul. The Holy Spirit doesn't operate on any other creature other than the human and God. Okay. So it's a connection on one end to God and on the other end is the human soul. There is no other creature and mm. no other intermediary mm. that can connect to the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit at this point in time, and I say at this point in time because it's not known in the future whether there might not be other attributes of God, yes. which God gives to us as gifts, as God gave divine love to us as a yes. gift. Right? So in the future, there might be other attributes of God that God may give to us as a gift and they might have a different type of energy mm. that needs to be connected in order for their gift to flow between God's soul and our own. But the Holy Spirit is this gift that opens up everything. Mm. It's, the, it's the energy, the conduit, 
for which the love can flow through. And it is the only connection that we can have directly with God mm. at this point in time. Uh, yeah, right? yeah. But it, it is also the one that is the primary one to experience because without it, the transformational effects of the, of the divine love won't occur on the human soul. Mm. And then, of course, any future gift that the human soul might be able to receive from God can't be received either. Mm. Yes. So everything is dependent upon our connecting with this divine love wow. and, and having this connection through the Holy Spirit. Mm. So the Holy Spirit is a very important energy of God, but it is not an entity. Sure. It is not God. Sure. It is not a part of God mm. in the sense of a, of a free-thinking individual part of God. Mm. It is just an energy of God, an attribute of God, a characteristic of God. You could think of it as God's arm mm. being held out to the human soul. Mm. 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 That's really what it is. Mm. Oh, that's excellent. Mm. Okay. Question nine. Does the belief that Jesus is God... Make it more difficult to feel God directly and to find the way home. Well, it's an interesting question, this one, because um, a lot of people intellectually believe that Jesus is God, while at the same time emotionally not accepting the belief. Mm. Does that make sense? Mm. Yes. So, so it really depends on whether the belief has been somehow imbibed in the soul as to, whether, as to how it controls their relationship with God. Now, if a person sincerely in their soul believes that I am God or that Jesus is God, then they will have a lot of difficulty ever becoming at one with God. Right? Mm. They will never become at one with God while that belief remains in their soul, in mm. fact. But if they have the belief in their mind, but not in their soul, sooner or later they'll realise that it's not a belief that they actually feel. Yeah. And that when they were connecting with, what, with who they called Jesus they felt at the time they were actually connecting with God mm. and not Jesus. Mm. And under those circumstances, they do connect with God and not Jesus. Mm. Does that make sense? It does. <laughs> so, so yes, the answer to the question is yes, in its core level, mm. at a soul level, if a person believes that Jesus is God, it is going to severely impact upon their ability to grow towards God and become at one with God. It also uh, severely impacts upon their impressions of me as Jesus. Mm. Like I am just their brother. I'm not, mm. their, I'm not their God or mm. creator. Mm. God is my creator. Mm. God is your creator, which makes us brother and sister. While you see me as God, you do not recognise that I'm just your brother. Mm. That's going to inhibit mm. your future growth in some way yes. sooner or later. Right? It also means that you're going to expect things of me that I can't deliver mm. because only God could deliver such mm. things. Does that make sense? It does, yeah. And, and very many people expect me to deliver things to them mm. that only God or God's love can deliver to them. Mm. But there are also many people, as you know, in religious faiths who say they're Christian and when they talk about the Trinity... But they don't personally believe it. <laughs> no, that's right. That's right. And they have received divine love as a result because their personal belief inside of their heart is that I'm not God mm. and that I'm a person who lived on earth and they're still not sure. Many Christians are very, very much not sure about my relationship to God. Mm. They know that somehow I came to explain God to, to people, but they're not sure how that actually occurred. But they don't believe I was God either. Mm. They just, many of them do believe I was a man, mm. even though their religious faith teaches mm. different to mm. that. Those people, of course, have very little effect when they realise that, that when someone comes and tells them, and often it's my, me who goes and tells them, and once they've passed, that um, I'm not God. Mm. And they go, oh, OK, I don't know if I really ever believe that either, mm. <laughs> you know. And so it's relatively easy for such people to continue their growth towards God. Yeah. Um, however, I have met many others and, uh, that, that have had this, such a strong belief that I am God that when they've asked for Jesus to come to them, I've come to them and they've told me that I'm not God, which I know that I'm not, of course, and, and, and then they've denied divine truth for many years, mm. sometimes hundreds, sometimes thousands of years as a result of that one teaching. So the belief of G that Jesus is God has a huge capacity to harm your relationship mm. with God. Mm. 
in a way, it's also a blasphemy towards God. Yeah. You're really saying that God is one of God's creations. Mm. And that's never the case. Mm. God, is, God is the creator mm. of all, not one of the creations. Yeah. And all I am is one of the creations of God. So um, we're really, in a way, blaspheming the true nature of God. Or if we use another word, we're misrepresenting the true nature of God. Now, we cannot become at one with God while we misrepresent the true nature of God to ourselves. In other words, in order to become at one with God, we must accept God's definition of God. And God's definition of God is not the Trinity. Mm. And God's definition of God is not that Jesus is God. Mm. Mm. God's definition of God is that there is one creator. And when you connect with God's love to a complete extent and stay open and humble without trying to hold on to a book, you eventually realise that. And once you realise that, you have a stronger connection with God because now you're believing the truth about the person you're connecting to. Mm. It's a bit like me and you. If, if I connected with you and you said to me, hi, AJ, my name's Claire. And I go, oh, hello, 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 Rosemary, hello, Rosemary. <laughs> and you go, no, 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 my name's Claire. And I say, hello, Rosemary. <laughs> you live in <laughs> Canada, don't you? No, no, I live over there. <laughs> and I go, yeah, you live in Canada. And you go, no, I live in Wigstown. And I go, no, no, you live in Canada. I'm sure you do. And, uh, and, and I don't listen to a single yes. definition that you give me about yourself. Yes. How much of a good relationship are we ever going to have? <laughs> You'll look at me and go, this man's crazy, right? <laughs> He believes a whole thing, a heap of things about me that are not true. <laughs> and this is exactly what happens yes. with most people's relationship with God. They believe a whole heap of things about God that are not true yeah. and then expect to be close to God. Mm. Mm. Now, you can't achieve closeness mm. to somebody while you believe a whole heap of false things Absolutely. about them. Just like I can't expect to achieve closeness with you mm. while I believe a whole false, heap of false things about you. So, so my suggestion to people is... We need to come to terms with what God really is yeah. rather than believing a whole heap of false things about God. Mm. Jesus is not God. Mm. If I hold on to the belief that Jesus is God, at some point in my future, yeah. God's going to say, yeah, you believe a whole heap of things about me that are not true, you know, including you believe that Jesus is me and mm. Jesus isn't me. See, so there's Jesus over there. Mm. 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 <laughs> and I say, yeah, here I am. I'm, over here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not God. You know? <laughs> And, and at some point in the future, the person is going to have to acknowledge that mm. in order to have a better connection with God. So when they say, when they said in the scriptures, I'm mm. qu qu hoping it's a good scripture, yeah. about when you, uh, you said that when you see me, you see the Father, is this demonstrating being at one? Yes. What I was saying when I said that, and I said something like that. I said mm. that when you see me, you see my father's qualities mirrored mm, in me. Mm, mm. And, and when you become at one with God, you're, you're in complete harmony with God's love. Mm, so mm. everyone around you sees how God would act in the same situation. Yeah, Does yeah. that make sense? So in a way, when you see the person who's at one with God, you can go, wow, that's also what God was like mm. or what God is like. And that's what I was saying to yes. people. I was saying to people that they, once I was at one with God, they could see what God was like. Mm. Just by examining my behaviour with people, they would be able to see how God would treat those people. Mm. Just by examining my behaviour with themselves, mm. they could see how God would treat them. Just by examining my desire for truth and desire, that's how much God desires truth and love. Yeah. Does that make sense? And if they, if they, and that's why I said, I have come to show God to you. Yeah. And anybody who sees me sees God. Mm. Right? That's right. Uh, these are all stu true statements, yes. but not in the, sta in the tri triune God sense. Mm, mm. They are in the sense of anybody who sees a person who's at one with God and acknowledges the qualities and attributes and characteristics of the person who's at one with God will also then, if they, if they allow themselves to contemplate, will actually see that that is God's nature too. Mm. And that's what I meant by those sure. kind of verses. Sure, of yeah. course. Of now, course. a lot of them have been manipulated and modified yeah. over time, of course. But, yeah. but in the end, I did say some of these mm. things or make these statements inferring that if a person observes me in my life, they, it's the same in a lot of ways as observing what God would do under mm. the same circumstances. Sure. Because when you're at one with God, you are in complete harmony with the way God expresses love. Mm -hmm. mm. Mm. Excellent. Now, this is our final question, question 10. Mm -hmm. Now that we've come to the end, can you tell me a little bit about 
your first century Mother Mary and Joseph and what they're actually doing now. Sure. Um, how far do you want me to go? And oh! Go? <laughs> how much time you know, do we have? Well, well, basically, you know, they've been alive for 2,000 years yes. and a bit longer than what I have. So <laughs> if I were to relate their entire life, obviously... Or what they're doing, time. you know, what their projects say are now. Sure. Well, they are both firstly in the one condition with God mm. and they are also at one with each other. In other words, mm. they've, they've completed the soul union yeah. and they are in the soul union state in, in what I feel now is the 36th dimension of the spirit world, wow. right? Now, um, they, they, in that state, have a huge amount of uh, abilities of things to do. Now, of course, the first thing that we engage ourselves in doing in that state is trying to help people on earth to also reach the same state. So, um, but the thing is in that state, when you're in a union state, you can manifest thousands of bodies at the same time. Mm. You can also manifest bodies on earth under certain conditions mm -hmm. at the same time, lots of them. So you have a way to share divine truth and help people have experiences to ga gather the truth and change in their heart through lots of different, you could call them manifestations of your own energy. Mm. Does that make sense? Mm. So they do that constantly. Mm. They are also in a complete union state with themselves, so they, they, they no longer see themselves as Joseph and Mary. <laughs> and they see themselves as people who once thought of themselves as Joseph and Mary. Um, they uh, still remember all of their experiences, of course, right through that 2,000 years mm -hmm. or so of their existence. And they spend the majority of their time sharing divine truth with mm -hmm. other people in the spirit world. Uh, in lower dimensions than right. they themselves exist. Right. There, there is a large amount of work to be done still. Like if you consider there's 7 billion people on the mm. planet, there is also around 30 billion people in the spirit world at this point in time who have, not, who, who have incarnated and left the earth. And of those billions, the majority of them are not, haven't, haven't even um, received God's love. Wow. When I say the majority... Yeah there's only a few billion that have received God's love. So in terms of percentages, only a few percent of the entire population that's ever lived on this planet mm. have actually received God's love. So that means there's a lot of work to do. Mm. And unfortunately, a lot of the work uh, revolves around shifting people from conditions of a lot of resistance and a lot of denial. And that requires generally a lot of effort as well. So they're spent, they spending their time educating and mm. as they go. But it's not only that. It's also like each time you progress through a dimension, obviously the new dimension has a whole heap of new truth associated with it. So it's like a universe yeah. right, in its own yeah. right. And in this universe, there's a whole heap of new truths about God and about the un God's universe that you can discover, right? Mm. Now... If you've been a spirit who's lived in that universe or that dimension for a long period of time and absorbed a lot of God's love, you understand a lot of that universe. But a person who's in the universe below or, or the sphere or dimension below mm. you, they don't know any of those things. Mm. And somehow you want to help them to know so that they can get to enjoy the same amount of happiness and love that you enjoy. Mm. So, so a large part of your work is educating uh, other spirits mm. to come to understand and know at a soul level, not at an intellectual level, mm. the things that you have come to understand and know. Mm. So they are helping a lot of spirits at this point in time to attempt to engage the soul union condition. Right? Because at the moment I'm not there, Mary's not there to, to help people with those particular things to engage as much as we could be, um, but, but there are other spirits now who have reached that condition who are trying to assist other spirits in the, in the celestial spheres right. to reach that union condition. And we see that as a pretty important role because, because without that occurring, it, it's like this, the, the more and more development we get in the spirit world, the greater the influence we can have on truth and love on the earth. Yes. And on any place in the spirit world up until the point of where which we are developed. Does that make sense? So 
So if we're in the union state, we have this beautiful ability to help every spirit, billions and billions of people from that state down to the state of the bottom of the house mm. just by our own changes in conditions of love, mm. by our growing, by mm. our discovering new truth. Mm. So that's also what they're employed doing as well. Mm. So they have a large degree of responsibility in that regard, mm. uh, as do some other spirits who have mm. reached the same condition. They have not reached their condition because they're my mum and dad. No, they've worked on them themselves. They've had to do it of for course. themselves. They've of had course. to enter this relationship with God for themselves, yeah. engage the re receipt of divine love for themselves, mm. develop humility and a desire for the truth themselves. Yeah. And if they hadn't have done that, they wouldn't have reached the condition mm. they're currently in. Mm. 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 And so reports of um, the apparitions, say, in Fatima in Portugal and... Mm. Um, in France, in Lourdes, and mm -hmm. just more, more recently. They seem to be, <clears throat> the, the, I don't know whether this is true or not, but the crux is, is to get people to start praying. It's yes, always... um, sometimes these apparitions are not anything well, to do with it's... spirits of a divine nature. Okay. Sometimes yeah. these apparitions are church supporters who exist in mm. the spirit world who are trying to increase the longevity of the church. Yeah, yeah. Other times, though, they are spirits of a higher nature trying mm. to inspire people to prayer. and Especially before there's some terrible war or something, there'll be a... Yes, but often they this... are also spirits often that are uh, more concerned about men entering war than the higher spirits are. The okay. higher spirits realise that war is just an effect of the condition of the human soul okay. that is out of harmony with love. And so the higher spirits are more focused on changing the human soul into a condition of love than mm. praying about a war. Yeah, I think they were preventing. I think all, all about prevention and about a transformation. Yeah, the, the higher spirits don't want to prevent a war um, in the sense that they don't want to uh, physically attempt a deed that would prevent a war. Okay. What they it's a waste to of do, energy, more or less. It is because the yeah. cause of war exists in the human soul, yeah. in the people who want to go to war. And what the higher spirits want to do is change the human soul sure. so that there's no longer the cause to go mm. to war. Mm -hmm. So the higher spirits focus more, uh, less on physical manifestations and more on changing or helping the human soul change. Mm. So a lot of these physical manifestations aren't actually mm. apparitions of and my... And some of them are a bit creepy. Though, yeah, yeah. A lot of them are dark ble spirits. Bleeding, uh, bleeding faces and, and all this yeah, kind of thing. They are quite dark spirits mm. who do these kind of things. Mm. And they do these kind of things in order to either scare people back into a religious faith mm. or to, 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 to suggest to people that their religious faith is the truth. Okay. Uh, the reality is no bright spirit above the eighth dimension would appear to anyone on earth in, uh, in a form like that. Oh, okay. Yeah. So anytime you see a form where it's, you know, blood from and coming from it or, no, no. you know, the so-called marks of the stigmata mm. or so forth. Mm. These are all lower level spirits. Yeah. Who are and, you know, scent of roses and that, <coughs> and that kind of thing. Yeah, well. sometimes scents can be attributed to higher spirits, mm. but oftentimes physical manifestations are not about higher mm. spirits and their mm. actual motivations. Yeah. But rather they're more about um, what people on earth expect from a higher spirit mm. to do. Of course. And of course, because their yeah. addictions are impure, a lower spirit comes along yeah. and does such the, the thing yes. that's yes. expected. Yeah. Mm. Oh, very good. And as you were saying, <coughs> Mary and Joseph now are one anyway. So wherever <coughs> one goes, the other one's there. So, Well, yes, but not in the way in which you think. Right. You see, uh, a, a union, a unified soul is capable of having multiple spirit and material bodies attached to it at the same time. So it may look like they're acting separately, but from their own perspective, they are unified in a complete whole oh, okay. and completely acting in harm harmoniously. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. But it may appear to the person who's interacting that they've talked to Mary or talked to Joseph okay. individually, okay. but that's not actually possible when you're in a unified soul. You're just talking to a physical, uh, a material manifestation, if you like, of the soul's expression. And so it's an energy coming from the soul that you're actually talking to not the soul itself. Although uh, when you get into that kind of state, you're able to absorb thousands and hundreds of thousands, in fact, of conversations all at the same time. So you know how God can absorb billions of conversations at mm, the same time mm. and interact with us at as fast as we can feel or think something. 
then when we become at one with our own soulmate, we have the capacity to absorb hundreds of thousands of such conversations at the same time. Wow. In other words, we have the ability to interact with hundreds of thousands of people all at the same time at the speed that the person's interacting. Mm. But for us, that's very slow. Does that make <laughs> sense? And that's how my mother and father are too. Mm. They can interact with hundreds of thousands of beings all at the same time mm. because their capacity, their soul capacity mm. has grown so mm. much and become more like gods mm. that, that they have the ability mm. to e have all of these conversations that are real for all the people experiencing yeah. them. So that would be ins inspiring. Oh, certainly. Yeah, that, yes. that would be an actual source of inspiration. For of course. They're not only a source of inspiration from a personal one-on-one -on -one discussion level, mm. but they're also a source of inspiration in that they've reached the soul union condition yeah. and therefore a source of inspiration to any spirit who has yet to reach that condition. Mm. So they're mm. a source of inspiration on many levels, mm. not just on a physical level of sharing truth or sharing love with a person in any of the dimensions below mm. their existence. Wow, 36 up to the 36th yeah. level, gee. Yeah, as far as I'm, I'm aware at this point. Like, <laughs> when I, I, I went through a stage a few months ago of just uh, having some greater awarenesses about my spirit life and as a result realising that there were more transitions but, uh, um, than 20 Mm. and 22, mm. and realising that there were actually transitions that happened at every seventh boundary yeah. that included incorporating some of God's attributes and qualities yes. into the human soul. And, uh, and, you know, I remembered the process of entering the 15th uh, dimension and, and, and receiving the ability to create, so to create living creatures. Mm. Not, cre not souls, not human souls, but living creatures that... that had life and a spirit body and a material body, mm. had the ability to create, whereas I never had that ability to create that before that time. Mm. Does that make sense? So while I was alive on Earth in the first century, I did not have that ability. Mm. No. So, um, and then I realised that each transition that we went through, every seventh sphere transition, had the ability to, um, you, you had additional abilities that God had that you didn't have prior to that transition. And once you made that transition, the abilities changed. And and it was the soul union condition, the, the, the 35th to 36th sphere transition um, that myself and Mary engaged together. And that is a unique transition because it also opens you to seeing souls mm. for, for the first time. Mm. In fact, up until that time, you can only see souls through your soul perception, through your ability to perceive their existence. But, but after that point, you physically can see them. Mm. You can see what they look like and how they grow and how divine love transforms them and mm. so forth. Mm. So, you know, uh, and that ability only comes through the unification of the two halves. Mm. So, um, so there's, yeah, a memory, if you like, of the different transitions and what each transition involves, which one day I'll discuss with people mm. when they're ready for those oh. discussions. <laughs> but, um, but those transitions, um, and it's probably better that as well that we get into the same condition again before we... Uh, before we discuss them, because then we can demonstrate them. And it's my far more powerful to demonstrate it than it is to discuss. Yeah. And, uh, and so that's partly what these spirits are all, including my mother and father, mm. are interested in doing as well, is making this transformation occur on earth so that divine love is offered as a conscious offering to every individual who's ever lived, yeah. rather than um, at the moment it being a distorted thing that's offered. You know, there's... There's things in the Bible and other holy books that indicate that divine mm. love is now available but, but are not clear in how to receive it and all those kind of things. So it's important that we discuss these fundamental truths first and then, then we can extend to the other truths about the universe and the growth of the soul. Mm. Mm. Wonderful. Mm. But thanks for your time in oh. uh, asking me these questions, Kaya. Thank and, you very uh, much. It was a wonderful experience. Yeah, <laughs> if, we, if we get some more questions about, uh, yeah. about Christianity as well, if you think of them, we're happy to answer more of them. We just feel that uh, we know that there's many spirits in the spirit world that have shifted uh, oh. listening to these questions. So it's been wonderful that we've Fabulous. had the ability to, to answer the questions as we have. And I'm sure many of them will have more questions as well, yeah. questions about doctrine, for example. That I'm very happy to answer as well as we proceed in the future. So fabulous. So thanks for your time. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah, my pleasure. <laughs> my pleasure. <laughs>